That was the Western Theatre, yet, though vast, only one tiny part of the whole. 1943, in far distant North Africa, a hotel at Casablanca. Here, in secret, gathering from all over the world, allied heads of state and chiefs of staff meet to decide the future, to plan and fix on where to strike, how to strike and when to strike, ships and supplies allowing, once the present phase of the struggle had reached its end. As soon, indeed, it would. For there, in Tunisia, a few hundred miles from their meeting place, British and American forces were squeezing the Africa Corps into the last remaining German-held pocket in Africa. Victory at last in the Mediterranean and all the many parts of that whole. Parts such as the island of Malta, that other wasp nest of air and sea power, from which the enemy had been stung all the way from Alamein to Bizerta, and would continue to be stung all the way to Naples. Then, for those modern scribes of battle, there was the Eastern Front. News to be passed on from Moscow, Leningrad, or victorious Stalingrad. News from a battlefield where, after two years of holding out against tremendous odds, the Soviet Union had now passed to the offensive. Where, on the boundless plains of Russia, the Nazi armies were being bled to death. Had Hitler's new empire been self-supporting, he would never have had to embark on his Russian war. But because of the wealth that others had and that he had not, Hitler's armies were fighting as far east as the Caucasus. For beyond those last blue mountains was wealth, the oil of the Caspian. And so, against the Russian guns, the main German effort. The effort which made Stalin call upon his allies for a second front, or in its stead, more and more guns, tanks, trucks and aircraft, tools of war to be brought by ill-spared allied shipping to the ports feeding the Persian lifeline. A lifeline in its turn feeding them across thousands of miles of mountain. Ships to Persia or ships round the icy North Cape to Murmansk, where each gun given to a Soviet soldier cost a British seaman's life. Yes, the German war was something to write about. But the fight against the Axis entailed more than just the struggle for Europe. The sun flag of China, waving over those who had been fighting this war longer than any because Japan had been at their throats ever since the early 30s. A China still fighting, thanks for the most part, to the supplies that reached her over the loops and twists of the Burma and Lido roads. With their own hands, the Chinese had built those roads, and it was up to China's allies to ensure that the traffic on them never slackened. But the Chinese weren't the only ones at war with the Japs. The Southeast Asia Theater, Burma, Mandalay, and a thousand bridges across a thousand river quays. The battlefield of Mount Batten and that elusive pimpernel of World War II, Colonel Wingate. A battlefield where white, brown, and yellow fought together, not only against the enemy, but also against disease, climate, and the very jungle itself. In front of the Japanese, on their flanks, and often like Wingate in their very rear, battling to win before the monsoons, too often battling to win during the monsoons. Yes, this Asian war, like the European, had a thousand sub-parts. Parts, for instance, like New Guinea, for the Australians who fought there the most important front of all. Because for each fighting man, the worst enemy is the one in front of him, the worst conditions, those that he is forced to fight under. And so they battled to drive the Japanese from the northern approaches to Australia in a steaming land where zero chasers now took the place of headhunters, a land of such inhospitality that it seemed fit only for war. But by far the greater part of the Asian war was the responsibility of the Americans. 
Across the US frontier with Canada, there runs a road built like the Burma Road for war. On it, a never-ending stream of supply trucks driving north through the mud of winter and the dust of summer until Alaska, where men once pioneered for gold and now the road pioneers for victory. Because it is just one of the roads that lead towards Japan. There, at the tip of Alaska, under the rainbows of almost incessant drizzle, bombers taking off to strike at the Japanese who had infiltrated into the extreme easterly islands of the Aleutians. For the Americans, any road towards Japan was the right road. And so the roads ran to, by a thousand Pacific islands and their deep lagoons, a paradise turned to purgatory by war. Upon all the islands that the Americans attacked, upon none did they find those who surrendered. The GI hated death and avoided it, but the Japanese soldier not only worshipped death, but in battle often sought it. For General MacArthur, each stepping stone back to the Philippines or towards Tokyo was a stone slippery with blood. For a real hell, as the Americans say who fought in it, try the Pacific for size. All men who run are not cowards. Only fools stay to be hit. Hour upon hour, bomb after bomb, attacker after attacker, each one not only worshipping death, but often seeking it. That was the kind of war it was in 1943, from Tunis to Murmansk, from Chongqing to Port Moresby. A war reaching across every land and every ocean. A struggle indeed, something to write home about.